I'm Dr. Ramin Shalini Amin, and I'm one of the stroke prevention fellows at UT. It's wonderful sure, sure. to have you here. Um, so today I have the pleasure in speaking with Dr. Jesse Dawson, a professor of stroke medicine at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. We're going to speak regarding the use of vagal nerve stimulation paired with, with rehabilitation to drive upper limb motor recovery after an ischemic stroke. Um, Dr. Dawson, before we get into the novel therapy of vagal nerve stimulation, um, what are the current therapies that are being used to address these motor deficits in patients post-stroke? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's important to start with that because rehabilitation obviously works and intensive rehabilitation obviously improves patient outcomes. And, you know, there's there's no suggestion that that isn't the case. The question really is, how can we make the recovery that we see in many patients apply to, or how can we make the recovery that we see in patients even greater? And traditional rehabilitation techniques, increasing dose, increasing the intensity, intensity of therapy is obviously important. And there are some data to show that the more that we can give people, the better. But I think it's important to say that we probably need to be giving people huge doses of therapy to get satisfactory outcomes. And that can be challenging for us to deliver in, you know, in wider clinical settings. Lots of techniques can support um, improvements. So things like robotic therapy um, has an effect on removing impairment. So if chasing a particular or reducing impairment, a particular impairment is, is, um, can help a specific aspect of function, then using things like robotics for high intensity therapy can help. And there are new devices coming, you know, available to us, such as glove devices that can help with finger extension to help people who have the most severe um, upper limb deficits engage in physical therapy. So there are lots of good things happening um, in the rehabilitation sphere for sure. And so can you explain what the Viva system is and how it works? Yeah, so the the Vivisim system is, is essentially it's a vagus nerve stimulator. So it's an implantable pulse generator like the vagus nerve stimulators that you would use and more commonly see being implanted for refractory seizures. The key difference, though, is the stimulation paradigm. So it doesn't use a, a simple on-off um, phenomenon or on-off stimulation throughout the day, it's only used to provide a brief half second pulse of vagus nerve stimulation during specific parts or specific times of a physical therapy session. So timed and paired with patient movement. In terms of how it works, I mean, that's obviously the electrical, if you like, mechanics of the device, which is the same as, as any other. In terms of how it works mechanistically, the underlying hypothesis is that VNS through its afferent connections to brainstem structures will increase activation of cholinergic and noradrenergic neuromodulatory networks. So essentially prime the brain for the adaptive responses that the intensive physical therapy will bring. Um, and in April of this year, you published um, a randomized triple blinded study in the Lancet using this device um, for post drug recovery. Can you tell me a little bit about the study and what you found? Yeah, so the study was a, was a randomized and, and blinded study and we, so all participants had the vagus nerve device implanted and it was, they were randomized to sham stimulation or active stimulation at the point of implantation. The study was done in the UK and the US and in total 108 participants were randomized. The therapy that was delivered involved a six week course of in clinic therapy, two hours, three times per week followed by a 90 day period of home therapy where participants were asked to do 30 minutes a day where they would activate the VNS device using a magnet that would deliver 30 minutes of VNS um, and they would do 30 minutes of, of prescribed exercises during that period. So that was the therapy that was delivered. Just to give you an idea of the intensity, I mentioned that it was two hours each session on average, there were a approximately 400 therapy movements or tasks were completed in each session. So it was fairly high intensity therapy that the control group got with sham stimulation and obviously the VNS group got the active stimulation. Our primary outcome was assessed at the day after the six week in clinic therapy. 
and our secondary outcomes were assessed at the 90 day period. So after they'd also had that period of home exercises. And what we found was that there was a small difference between groups in the Fugelmeyer score. There was just around a three point difference in the Fugelmeyer score on average. That was our primary outcome assessment at the day one post clinic therapy. Our main secondary endpoint was to look at the response rate. So what proportion of patients achieved what we believe to be a clinically important response or a six point change on the score. And that rate was doubled in the VNS treated participants at just under 50%, 47% to be exact, compared to about 24% in people who received the sham stimulation and the control physio. So I think the key thing there is that the between group difference is small. And I think that is something that is, you know, that needs to be considered and, and, and needs to be um, discussed. But when you looked within patients, the number of patients who had a satisfactory response was substantially higher. And do you have any particular patient that you recall just had a significant amount of improvement that you saw anyone that you think back to? I mean, so, so certainly anecdotally, yes. You know, when we looked at, at some patients, um, the, the, some patients had very large responses. And I think, you know, the anecdotes are, are helpful once you've established the fact that there's a clear difference between groups, because obviously we do see significant improvements in patients through natural recovery or through physical therapy alone. The, the anecdotes tell us, you know, the people who, for example, got back to playing the piano, back to playing golf, changing nappies and grandchildren. I think really the only, I only like to kind of talk about that in the context of it tells us that the changes that we see in the patients that had the six point change are clinically important. Um, and, and that, you know, that these changes do lead to improvements in, in somebody's life quality. And again, although we didn't analyze these things statistically, when we looked at quality of life scales, motor activity, logs, stroke impact scale, there were definite numerical differences in, in favor of VNS, albeit the caveat that we haven't analyzed those things statistically. And I saw you had mentioned something about the Beck depression scale also, so must have seen improvement. Yeah, so we we didn't see much change in the depression scales actually, and, and the reason for including the depression scale and why it wasn't listed in the study as, as one of the, um, if you like, efficacy outcomes, we were asked to, to look at that um, um, by the regulators as a, a more a safety outcome to check that we weren't causing mood disturbances or mood changes, mood elevations because of VNS and its putative role in, uh, you, you'll be aware it has been previously studied as a treatment for depressive disorder, but we didn't see much in the way of change. We did see reports of, of um, positive mood change in, in some of the stroke impact scale measures, again, on a numerical basis. Mm -hmm. um... And so I saw that you included patients from six months up to 10 years post stroke, and those results were promising. Was there a particular reason you didn't include um, patients that had, had the stroke for more than 10 years after that? Uh, no, um, there, there wasn't really. And I think we, we had an average of, of three years after stroke. So most of our experience is treating people between six months and say three to five years at the most. We had very few patients who were a very long time after their stroke. I think what, what we learned, I think, when we look at the data is that provided we have exclusion criteria that um, limits the number of patients that have the sorts of problems that come with very long periods after the stroke, like spasticity, shoulder contractures, other flexion deformities. Time doesn't appear to matter too much, provided that they have a limb that should be responsive to, to an intensive intervention. We haven't looked in depth at all of the subgroup analysis from the main study. That's a piece of work that is ongoing, but certainly the initial analyses don't suggest there is any hugely important effect of time, providing those caveats that we don't include people with spasticity, etc. So which patients would be ideal candidates for Vivistim then? So I think, yeah, so I think we would definitely say it's people who have moderate to moderately severe upper limb deficits 
our studies always included people that were able to have a little bit of wrist extension, a little bit of thumb movement, for example, so they could engage in intensive physical therapy. So if somebody is fit and robust enough for surgery, they have upper limb deficits that are significantly impacting their quality of life, and they have the ability to engage in ten intensive therapy, they, they, they should be a good candidate. So uh, did you see an age group um, in which you found the most benefit or again, you didn't? We, we haven't done it. Again, our, our, so we have looked at the effect of age in a bit more depth in, in, the, in the main trial. And no, there doesn't appear to be an obvious effect of age. Again, though, it's important to say that that's within a very, within a relatively narrow band of, of younger stroke patients with a, a, a mean age. I forget the exact number, but I think around them. Um, I think around 62 was the mean age. So we are dealing with a younger, more robust population. I think we can't say whether these benefits would extend to much more elderly, more frail stroke patients, but then our enthusiasm for performing an implant under general anesthesia on these patients is perhaps less anyway. Um, so it's FDA approved now, Vivistim. Um, to my knowledge, how do you recommend physicians go about implementing this therapy to get maximum benefit? Yeah, so that I think there are still some implementation questions that need to be answered. I think obviously with any intervention, particularly one that is invasive, um, it, it's critical to stick exactly to the trial criteria and eligibility criteria and not to extrapolate benefit to other groups. I think that the crucial thing is that care pathways, you know, this isn't simply put the implant in and then they can go away and things will radically get better. It has to be part of a, a, a very robust, intensive physiotherapy regimen with a lot of patient support and a lot of, of instruction on how to do their home exercises. So it's really a very holistic care pathway re requiring anesthetic consult, neurosurgical input, stroke physician input, stroke rehabilitation input, and, and therapy input. So, and I think some of the questions that are outstanding for me with regard to implementation is, you know, should, for example, if you have a patient who's four years post-stroke, hasn't had physical therapy for two years, should you give that person some physical therapy and see if that alone is helpful before you move to implantation? And, and again, that's not what we did in the study, but certainly a question that the future could, could try to answer. So, and then I know you'd mentioned that it was ischemic strokes and um, supratentorial strokes. Hmm. Future of this therapy, do you think there might be a role for it in other types of strokes and perhaps even a similar benefit for low extremity weakness? Yeah, so I think all we can say at the moment is that the preclinical experimental stroke model data would tell us that that could and should be the case. For example, in hemorrhage models, the benefits are the same. In um, uh, there are some studies in spinal cord injury, for example, that seem to give uh, you know broadly similar findings. So there's no reason why it couldn't be extended, and no reason why we shouldn't study other impairments. But at the moment, that's entirely a hypothesis and based on preclinical data and no clinical data. Um. Well, it's all very exciting and innovative, and we know we tell patients all the time that their recovery is usually just, you know, six months to a year. But, you know, with this, it can truly impact the, the patients that have more chronic deficits and, like you said, give them hope for a better quality of life, especially when it translates clinically in things they can do every day um, that we may take for granted we don't recognize. Um, are there any other comments that you would like to make, Dr. Dawson? No, I think that's a really good final comment. And I think it, it goes alongside some of the observational um, work of the clinical services. Nick Ward, um, his service in UCL in London had run a, an ultra intensive, I would call it, upper re limb rehabilitation service. And I think that, along with the data from this trial, tells us that actually people with chronic upper limb impairments from stroke can improve even years after with very aggressive and intensive physical therapy. How we deliver that to tens of thousands of people is, of course, a very separate question, but it's a positive message nonetheless. Something we can work on. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much again. I appreciate the time. I know you're busy um, and I hope to speak to you again. Um, Great. Uh, likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.